So if you've got a charge Q, that charge is going to create an electric field and that charge is gonna create an electric potential. What I mean is, here's a charge Q and it's orange because this charge here is orange because this charge here is creating, this is important. This is the charge in this formula that creates that electric field. Creates that electric field, creates it everywhere around it, radially outward if it's a positive charge and if it were a negative charge, swap the direction of the arrows, it would go radially inward. Similarly, this charge creates an electric potential everywhere, everywhere around it, so creates that V. So if you plug Q into this formula for V, uh, that is the Q creating the V that you're talking about, that you're solving for. Now these formulas aren't that hard to like solve for mathematically. You just plug in the R you want. So if this E is 10 meters away, you'd plug in 10 here, plug in the Q that's creating the E at that point, and it gives you the electric field. Similarly for electric potential, you don't even have to square the R or worry about the vector nature because electric field is a vector. This has a direction. Electric potential doesn't even have a direction. It is simply a number. Could be positive or negative, but it's simply a number at some point in space. And so this Q and every other Q is creating an electric field and electric potential everywhere around it. You find it with these formulas. Fine, easy. However, what if your electric charge isn't a point? What if it's spread out over space? Say you took that same charge Q, but you distribute it uniformly across a like rod right here of length L. And let's say this time you want to find what's the electric field at point X, uh, distance, you know, X away from the right side of the rod. Well, you can't just blindly be like, okay, one over four pi epsilon naught, total Q over what? X squared? What are you going to put X? Because that's how far the E at this point, like we know if this is positively charged, the E would point radially to the right um, because it points away from a positive charge. But what are you gonna plug in? X, that's how far this end of the charge is from that point. What are you gonna plug in? X plus L, that's how far this end is. You're gonna do the average. You can't do any of that. You have to actually solve this using an integral. So you have to be clever. If your charge is distributed over some like, you know, line or area or something like that, a volume, you're gonna to have to do an integral to find the electric field. So what do you do? You use this formula, but you're gonna to have to be clever. The way you're clever about it is you, you say, look, this formula gives me the electric field from a point charge. Well, you turn this into a point charge. Specifically, you turn it into an infinite amount of point charges. So imagine you break this up. Now this is not infinitesimal, but imagine this is an infinitesimally thin, right here, little slice of Q. In fact, that would be a differential amount of Q. That's what we mean by dQ, a differential amount, infinitesimally small. Well, that you can tell me how far away it is. So this is exactly that far, whoops, too far. This is exactly that far away from that point where we wanna find the electric field. Like let's say we wanted to find the electric field over here. This has an exact location. So I could say, all right, that little dQ, that infinitesimal charge creates, it's gonna be a really little E, you know, it's gonna be a really tiny differential amount of E. I can't even draw it differentially small, but it'd be a infinitesimally small amount of electric field because there's hardly any charge at all. So you turn this into DE, you say, well, if a big charge creates electric field E, you say that a differentially small amount of charge is gonna create a differentially small amount of electric field over here. And so this formula is true. It's just R, you have to be careful. R is from that charge to this point here. So we need, you know, uh, we could label this in a certain way. We can call this R right here. So that's gonna be R. From the DQ to that point where we wanna find the electric field. Okay, but that's just the electric field from one little infinitesimal amount of charge. We need the electric field from all of them. Those that are closer will contribute more because they're closer to that point. Those little differential amounts that are far away, like this one's gonna create the least amount of electric field, they're all contributing. And they're all gonna contribute with electric field to the right, that's important. Positives all create fields radially out. So they're all pointing rightward. We can just add them all up to get the total. How do you add up an infinitesimal amount of things? You integrate. So we'd have to integrate both sides, integrate both sides. The left-hand side just becomes the total E. So this, hand, this side's gonna become E, and that's gonna be equal to, I can pull out all this extra stuff. I can pull out the one over four pi epsilon naught. I cannot bring out the 
the dq obviously that's the differential that's going to be integrated i also can't pull out the r squared this r is going to be different for each little charge sometimes you get to pull out r squared in this case we do not get to pull out r squared so it's going to be dq differential amount over r squared well i've got dq and i've got r down here so what you're going to have to do is change dq into something else this is the first order of business what you're typically going to do is just say that all right we have to talk about charge per length so lambda lambda is there a b i'm going to put a b lambda is going to be charge per length that's what we mean by lambda it's the amount of charge per length and let's just say this is uniformly distributed you could have some crazy lambda that like depends on x it gets more and more dense as you go fine whatever you'd plug that in but all we need here is to say that well q is going to be lambda times l okay so how about dq i mean i want a differential amount of charge well if you take the charge per length and you multiply by a differential amount of length you'll get a differential amount of charge so all this formula is saying is if i know how much charge i have per length coulombs per meter that's what this is going to be coulombs per meter if i know how many coulombs per meter i have and I multiply by this little infinitesimal amount of meters, I'll get the infinitesimal amount of charge that's in there. So this is what we're gonna use for dq, at least if you have a line, like a 1D example. So dq is gonna become that. So we're gonna have equals, in fact, I'm just gonna write it in here. Let's just erase it. You're gonna have a lambda dl, lambda dl. I'm gonna pull the, the lambda out. So lambda is gonna come out here that's a constant. If it wasn't a constant, you'd leave it in the integral and integrate. Whatever it was as a function, maybe it's like x, x squared, who knows, but lambda comes out here. You have dl. Well, I'm still like, crap, well, this is l, that's r. I need the same variable here, but, but what is dl referring to? It's referring to this little bit of length here. So that's dl right there. Uh, an infinitesimal amount of length um, that's the same as dr. Look, r goes in the same direction here. I mean, if you want to be very careful about it, you could define l. Define l as like this distance here from the one end. And then you could say, all right, you could say that l plus x, right? l plus x. So every one of these gets a little address. This one would have an l of zero. This has an l of l. This over here has an l of capital L. L gives you little l, gives you the location of the charge. You could say that that l that location from the right end plus x has to equal r but look if i take if i take a differential of both sides x we're just keeping fixed so that means dl just equals dr in this case so i'm going to replace this with dr dl dr like it's the same thing you can call these dx and write this r as x we're talking about the same direction here these are all along the x direction so we call this dr and this is what we're going to use to solve uh, now it's not too bad i just need to get my limits right I'm integrating r, not l. So r is going to go from not zero. None of these little differential amounts of charge were zero away from this point over here. Remember, r is from your infinitesimal amount of charge to the point where you want to find the electric field. So the closest I get is this little dq right there. That is the closest I get, and that is x away. So the r value, which is from charge to the point where you want to find the field, the closest I get is x. The furthest I get is over here, and that is going to be x plus l. So the largest r value I get is x plus l. So you solve this, you're going to get lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught. Integral of 1 over r squared is negative, negative 1 over r. Oops, negative 1 over r. You evaluate that between, between x and x plus l. I'm just going to write it up here. You're going to get, uh, I'll pull the negative out, lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught evaluated between x plus l. So you get 1 over x plus l. I pulled the negative out front, so I don't have to deal with it. Minus 1 over x. Um, if I don't want that negative out here, I can bring it inside if I want um, and just reverse the order of these. So I can bring that negative inside and I can say, actually, I'm going to do this term here minus that term there. Just swap the order and you bring the negative inside. And so that's our formula for the electric field at this point, um, x away from the right hand side of this bar. Like this is the E. E is this, the total E. Total E equals that. 
Um, what would you do if you want to find the electric potential over at this point? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. Like you got this formula. What's the difference? Well, it's not a vector, but that didn't even really matter here. All these E's went in the same direction, so we didn't even really have to worry about the vector nature of this E. We just added them up blindly. V doesn't even have a vector, so we wouldn't have to worry about that anyways. And it's R instead of R squared. So let's just look. Let's just try to identify. What would be different? Well, this would obviously be DV. This would just be R instead of R squared. Oops. Uh, so this would be... Oop, it's not even letting me erase that. This would be r instead of r squared. dq still becomes lambda dr. r still goes from x to x plus l, right? This would be v. So when you integrate this, the only difference is that instead of getting, you know, negative 1 over r, you'll get that v is lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught. The integral of 1 over r is log. So you're going to get log of, and there's no negative now. So integral of 1 over r squared gives you a negative. Integral of 1 over r doesn't give you a negative. It's going to be log of x plus l minus log of x because it's going to be evaluated. Integral of 1 over r, sorry, integral of 1 over r is log r. And so log of x plus l minus log of x. And you could simplify this because you can write that as, you can write the difference of logs as the log of a ratio. So you could say that v total at that point would be lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught log of x plus l over x. There we go. You can simplify it. You can write it as 1 plus l over x if you wanted to. But that's v total at this point. The total v created by all of these dqs added up. And it's going to be, this is going to be the e at that point due to all the qs added up. Notice it's not as simple as just taking like this original formula and like plugging in x or plugging in l. You have to do an integral to, the, to get the value uh, recapping. You break this up into a bunch of infinitesimal amounts of charge. Those are each at a given distance, and then you add them all up by taking an integral. So this was the linear case. What do you do if you get this case? You're like, no, not the curvy. The curvy is the worst. It's actually not that bad. Let's say you wanted to find e at this point, right in the center. This time you got a curve of charge. Oh, wait, I didn't finish this one. Technically, here's what you'd have to do. I wrote this in terms of lambda. But let's say you weren't given lambda. Like, I wasn't given lambda. I was given Q and L. So at the very end, instead of writing lambda here, you'd write it as Q over the length of your object. So everywhere I had a lambda, I'd write it as Q over L. So this would have to be Q over L right here for lambda at the very end. And I can write this as q over l for lambda right here if you're not given lambda sometimes you're given lambda sometimes you're given q uh, use whichever one you're given obviously um, okay so what if you have this case now you take that q you distribute it over half of a circle a semicircle of radius r we want to know the electric field right in the center before we do that one let's do the electric field or sorry the electric potential this one's going to be easier let's say we want to know the electric potential in the center well, what do we do? We again break this into infinitesimal little pieces. So I break this into an infinitesimal amount of charge. DQ, right there. So an infinitesimal amount of charge, and that's going to create an infinitesimal amount of V. So an infinitesimal amount of V at that point. Basically nothing, but not nothing. <laughs> so DV gets created by an infinitesimal amount of DQ. How much does it make? This much, because like you plug in the Q you got, you plug in the V, Let's integrate both sides. What are we going to get? The side becomes V equals, all right, so I pull out my constants, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now, here's the magical thing. Look at every single dq that you can consider, this one here, this one down here. There's something similar about all these, and that is that they are all the exact same radius away from this point. That wasn't true for our line charge. Our line charge had points that were close, points that were far for this loop, the nice thing about it is that they're all the same distance away. So you're like, what? That means I could pull out R? Yeah, you could pull out R. R is the same for all of those. And you're like, hold on, that just means I get integral dq? Yes, you do. And what's the integral of dq? It's just q. So you get v is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Now you might be like, wait a minute. That's just the original formula up here. You know what I mean? Like if I if I got rid of this integral nonsense, if I had just gotten rid of all this and plugged in my total Q, 
I get the exact same thing. That's because V is just a, you know, not a vector, it's a scalar. You can just add up all the values here. This DQ here up the top contributes just as much V as this point does, as this point does, as that point does. So having it in this loop is no better than just concentrating all of this charge right there. So you just took all that positive Q and put it right there. It'd still make a, a green V value of this value at that point. Same as if you spread it around, doesn't matter. As long as it's all the same distance away from a point, it's gonna contribute the same V at that point. So you might be like, all right, well then E should be just this, right? Well, no, unfortunately. And the reason is electric field is a vector. This piece right here is gonna create a DE that goes this ways. Let me draw it straight. That goes that way. So that DE from this piece of DQ goes radially out because it's positive. That's the little bit of DE from this piece. What about the DE from this piece over here? Well, it would create an E that goes radially out from it. And you're like, uh-oh, well, those ain't gonna add up easy. I can't just add up these two numbers. Like if this one was two and that one was two, the total field isn't four. Look, the vertical components of these are canceling and that's true for any of these points. This top one creates a field that goes straight down. This bottom one creates a field that goes straight up. All the vertical components cancel. If you had this one here, it'd be perfect. It goes right along the horizontal. The only part that's gonna matter is the horizontal components. You have to add all those up. So we don't actually wanna find the total E. I mean, we do. It's just the vertical parts are gonna cancel. These verticals cancel those verticals. These cancel these verticals. The only part that survives is the horizontal piece. So what I have to do is like, okay, shoot, this is a vector. I need to make sure I like find E in the X direction. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna call it DQ, fine, and that makes this DE. But if I only want the piece in the X direction, you know, if I only want that piece right there, so that's gonna be DE, little component in the X direction. This is DE in the X direction. I need to multiply by, you know, a sine or a cosine, and uh, it depends on how you wanna define this. I'm gonna define my angle. You have to do this, you have to draw this out. This is important. Draw where you want to measure your angle from. So if you're taking sine or cosine, there has to be an angle measured from somewhere. I'm just going to choose the center line is where I'm going to measure theta from. So I'm going to call that theta. So I'm going to say that this DQ is located at that theta right there. Well, that means this is also theta. These are interior angles here. So if I want to find DEX instead of DE, I would take my total DE, which is the hypotenuse here. This DE was the total field that that DQ up here created. And then I multiply by cosine theta because this is the adjacent piece. So I multiply by cosine of theta. Now I'm ready. These I can add up. You can add up all the DEXs because those all go the same direction. There's no point in adding up all the DEYs. Those are going to cancel. Like you can do it if you want. They're all going to be zero. Take my word for it. Um, or try it if you want. It doesn't matter. So now you can integrate. Integrate both sides. Left-hand side becomes E in the X direction total, which is just E total because the vertical is going to cancel equals, bring out your constants, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, r squared. You might, you might be like, wait, is r squared still constant? Yeah, this is just a far, as far away as that is, as far as that, as far as that. These are all the same distance from this point where we want to find the electric field. So you can still bring r squared out. This is the great news. r squared comes out. I write it as capital. And I get integral uh, dq. So let me find my yellow here. Integral of dq uh, just times cosine theta. So we're not quite as lucky. Over here, we just got dq. All right, well, if you get integral dq, that's just q. But integral of dq times cosine theta is not just q. You might be like, can I bring the cosine theta out? You can't. Look, these are all at different angles. They're all at the same r, but this one's at this much of an angle. This one up here would be at that much of an angle. You know what I mean? So they're all at different angles. I can't just bring my theta out of the integral. It's varying. So what do I do? Same thing we always do. You write dq as something else. So you're like, shoot, I have to actually have to do the integral. What do I do? Well, I know uh, q is going to be lambda times l. So just like we did before, dq is going to be lambda times dl, where dl is this little bit right here. So this little length right there is dl, that infinitesimal length right there. Width is dl. And if I multiply that little length by the charge density, linear charge density. Lambda times that little DL gives me the infinitesimal amount of DQ in that region. So this is what I replace DQ with down here. So this DQ 
is going to be lambda times dl. Does that help at all? It does. Lambda gets to come out of the integral because it's a constant. Again, maybe lambda is not a constant. If your lambda is not a constant, fine. Again, as always, leave it in the integral. You'll have to be told what that lambda is, and if you know what the lambda is, you can just integrate it according to whatever the integral is. But in this case, I'm going to assume that this lambda is constant. We can bring it out. We still have a problem. This is theta. That's L. They need to be in terms of the same variable. That's not too hard to fix. The way we're going to fix that is we're going to say let this DL is a little bit of an arc length. Look at So hopefully you learned about arc length at some point. S. S is R times theta. Well, I should say delta theta. A little bit of an arc length is going to be S uh, is R times delta theta. Well, how about an infinitesimal amount of arc length? That would be R times d theta, you know, a differential amount of theta. So the theta between this line here and that line there, I mean, it's the slice of all slices. This angle in here would be d theta, the ultimate slice right here, the, the thinnest slice you can imagine. If you took that thin slice of theta multiplied by the r, that just equals arc length. So this is the formula for arc length. You need to know that to do these problems. But that's ds, well that's just what I'm calling dl. dl is the same as ds. So dl here is going to be r d theta. You might object and be like, wait, ds is curved. dl is straight, not if it's infinitesimal. If it's infinitesimal, ds is straight. There's no time for it to curve. I know that's weird. Sorry, that's math. And so ds is the same as dl. Plug this in for dl down here, and you're going to get r times d theta so dl becomes r times d theta. Now you can integrate, you just need some limits. So what are we going to integrate from? Well, it depends on how you define your theta. So I define theta as from here. So I'm going to come all the way from negative that. Like if this is if this is theta equals 0 right there, I need to come from negative pi over 2 because that's where this point is. My my dq with the smallest possible theta would be negative pi over 2, based on where I made my 0. And my biggest one would be pi over 2. So I got to go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. The r gets to come out. So like r I can just bring out. In fact, I can cancel this r with one of these r's. So that's not harming anybody. I would take the integral of cosine. And that's not too bad either. The integral of cosine is just going to be sine. You might be like, is it negative? No, integral cosine is positive sine. So we're going to get lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught times r. Integral of cosine is just sine theta evaluated between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. What does that become? You're going to get lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Sine of pi over 2 is just 1 minus Sine of negative pi over 2, this is negative pi over 2. Sine of negative pi over 2 is negative 1. So that's just 2. 1 minus a negative 1 is just 2. And so you get that the electric field, I'll write it over here, the electric field is going to be 2 times lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Now, again, I didn't give you lambda, so you have to plug that in. What is lambda? Lambda is always just defined to be the charge per length. Again, if you're given lambda, fine, leave it like this. If you're not given lambda, got to put it in terms of stuff you know. So you put this in as charge per length, but you're still not done. You're still not done because I didn't even give you the length. You might be like, do I put R? No. Q isn't spread over one radius. Q is spread over one semicircle. This is the length that the charge is spread over. What is that length? Well, it's half of a full circle. A full circle is... You know, a full circle's circumference is 2 pi r. That'd be the length of a full circle. This is a half circle. Half circle is just pi r. So you divide this by pi r, and you can clean this up. You can write this as q over, I guess you'd have 2 pi squared. Epsilon naught r squared would be the electric field. It's in the x direction. The total electric field in that x direction that this little loop creates. That would be the electric field in the x direction. The vertical component would cancel. How do you know that? Well, look, we took cosine theta to get this horizontal piece. You'd do sine theta to get the vertical piece. And if you integrated sine theta, you'd get cosine theta, but cosine of pi over 2 and cosine of negative pi over 2 are 0. So it's all going to cancel out. So the vertical parts cancel. 
you only get the horizontal part. For V, it's easy. You just use the formula. Why did we get to just use the formula? It's because V doesn't have any vector directions. We had to multiply by this cosine in order to pick just that piece we wanted in the X direction, that piece that wasn't canceling, so that we add all those up. Uh, and if you do that, you do the integral, you solve, you get your electric field. So to recap, uh, what you need to do is use the formula for electric field, but plug in dq instead of q, and that means you have to integrate it. dq, you almost always have to write as lambda dl. Uh, once you have that, pull out anything that's constant. Make sure you're consistent with your limits based on how you defined your angle up here. That'll dictate how you define cosine theta here too. Since I defined theta from this point, I've got to use cosine theta to find that e. Run your integral get your limits, solve, you get your value, and then at the very end, if you're given lambda, leave it as lambda. If you're not given lambda, write lambda as what you're given.